I'm Vicki Hogarth and welcome to Southwest Magazine. This episode is part of our Closer Look series that examines the rise of drug use, crime and homelessness in Southwest New Brunswick. In this series, we will look at the human stories behind the statistics and also talk to experts about these critical issues as we look for solutions. I'm joined today by Diane Kearns of Avenue B. Thank you so much, Diane, for being with me here today. My pleasure. Now, I want to talk to you about the specific work you do at Avenue B. Um, and right. But first, can we talk about harm reduction? You are the program coordinator for harm reduction at Avenue B. I what am. Is, what is harm reduction for those of us who still need more clarity? Right, so harm reduction really is what it says. It's around reducing harm for people and in our work, um, that's around sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections like HIV and hepatitis C. So it is not trying to change what people are doing, but how they're doing it. So providing materials and resources to help keep people, keep people safe um, for themselves and for our community, keeps our community safe at the same time. So we run a needle exchange, we have a sex trade action committee, we have a sharps in community uh, where we have sharps kiosks and containers out in community doing needle sweeps, um, anything at all that we can do uh, to try and reduce harm uh, related to substance use. But our main focus really is our client. Can you tell us a little bit about Avenue B, how long it's been around and how long you've been implementing these programs? Right, so uh, those are, I, I am not a statistics person. <laughs> I keep mm -hmm. track of these. But since the late 80s um, into the early 90s, 90s I think with the, um, you know, every, everybody is familiar with HIV and AIDS and, and the number of people who were dying and, and um, how hard that time was. Um, that's, that was the birth of our organization. Um, and we were known as AIDS St. John back at that time, but um, that no longer uh, provided um, a real sense of what we do as an organization and so we moved to our current uh, our current name um, and it was in the 90s um, that the realization that HIV uh, in particular uh, there was transmission happening as a result of substance use and use of needles and so that was the beginning of uh, looking at running a, a full-fledged needle exchange um, we often call needle distribution now but even that's a bit of a misnomer it really is harm reduction uh, supply that we provide um, it's not just uh, needles. So we started out with just the needles and then it was adding in um, inhalation supplies like crack kits and meth pipes and uh, it could be straws for somebody who's um, who is snorting uh, and so on. So it really is a wide range uh, of supplies that are provided now. So we zoom ahead. It seems like just not that long ago, but here we are, you know, over 25 years. Uh, I feel like with needles, it's pretty obvious uh, why would there would be issues with dirty needles. Mm -hmm. um, why the other supplies as well? What is the purpose? Right. So we really want everybody to have new materials every time, um, new, not used. Um, we see everything we do has a purpose and so often when I'm out doing a presentation I'll bring sample of everything that we have and say this is what what we're doing and the needles is a great example to go back to I'll get to the pipes but mm -hmm. um, we distributed new needles and swabs and then we added cottons as a filter because we found out people were using cotton balls and cigarette filters and filters were being shared so we added cookers as well um, that were being used to prepare what was going to be injected um, because with the needles we still saw transmission so what's happening there were other transmission points and so the if the cottons are reused and the cookers are reused and so those all become points of transmission so 
supplies kept being added. And then we see a crisis with hepatitis C. So it's not just HIV. Um, and transmission of hepatitis C is much more prevalent. Um, and a lot of baby boomers who have no idea that they're in a high risk group from home tattoos, sharing nail clippers, toothbrushes, pierced earrings, razors, these kinds of materials. We think we know who these people are, um, but it really can be any of us. So we started to look at what are some of the other materials and with pipes, people's lips get cracked and bleeding. Hepatitis C is transmitted blood to blood. So if we're sharing a pipe and my lips are bleeding and your lips are bleeding, we have a transmission. Um, and so we started providing crack pipes and then um, meth pipes or bowl pipes are ones that were recently uh, added uh, as we saw crystal meth move into our region. So I can go on on that oh, topic for a for while. Sure. And I, know that, I know that you've been in St. Stephen in particular yes. to, to speak at groups at Neighborhood Works yeah. to familiarize the community with the work you're doing. Um, right. Why do you think a community like St. Stephen, as we see the use of drugs rise in particular, mm -hmm. could benefit from implementing some harm reduction strategies? We actually have been working in St. Stephen area probably over 20 years. Um, I think there's been some momentum in community with people wanting to be more knowledgeable about harm reduction. And so we have uh, a number of different groups uh, who have done harm reduction training uh, at neighbor. We've used the space at Neighborhood Works. Neighborhood Works has organized a harm reduction day. Last spring we had a community meeting. We've done naloxone training. We did training harm reduction and naloxone training with staff at the warming center uh, last year. But as we see a rise in homelessness, uh, in a housing crisis, um, the problem becomes more visible. And I think the other thing we're seeing is the move from pharmaceutical grade substances to illegally made substances means that people are sick. P we see op opiate overdose or if we're talking about street made drugs, we're talking about poisoning. Um, and homelessness just exacerbates all of that. It makes it more visible and people don't want to see that. You know, it's one thing to have it and not know it, but when we see it, people are upset. Then we have the arrival of crystal meth, which historically has been the northern part of the province, probably Frederick Moncton North, St. John in from St. Stephen to Sussex has been more crack than crystal meth. COVID helped move crystal meth along because of course, supply lines were cut off. Crystal meth can be made locally. And cr with crystal meth comes very often um, psychosis that's extended for a period of time. Um, we see people who are agitated, um, aggressive, uh, perhaps people perceive as dangerous, uh, and, and they c very well could be. Um, and so that changes everything for a community. When we see all of these substances that are poisoning our people and killing our people and ra raising havoc in community, um, that people want to know more and want to get involved. Wow, I, you know what, that's illuminating to hear that about COVID-19 and crystal yeah. meth, because we've wondered, you know, we're hearing more and more about it yeah. here locally, and yeah. to hear that explanation mm. makes well, a lot of sense. And, the, you know, the other thing is that we're seeing is the opioid crisis or the overdose crisis or the poisoning crisis that we're seeing is we see doctors tightening up on prescribing opiates. Um, and, you know, on, it's really not their fault that this has happened, um, they cannot predetermine who will be addicted and who will not. Um, was there over prescribing? Most certainly, but that's not the norm. Um, so we see the tightening up of that pharmaceutical grade supply. And in the province of New Brunswick, we see the implementation of the New Brunswick Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, which also means you can't go to a couple of pharmacies and a couple of doctors. You can't steal a prescription pad and write a prescription. And so we see a further tightening of 
uh, pharmaceutical grade. So what I mean is pills that have come from the pharmacy that get skimmed out of the system. Mm -hmm. So somebody gets it and doesn't need it and sells it or sells a few or uh, steals grandmas and sells those. Um, we see a tightening of that. And so we see all this illegally made um, drug arrive in our community that's made elsewhere, that's run by big drug dealers. They're not the local people. They're not the local dealer even. They're big organized crime that are doing, um, bringing all of this stuff to our community and it changes everything. Mm -hmm. When we look at overdoses, I'm hearing reports um, as we're filming this as a, as a new one sadly in St. Stephen. I don't, I haven't heard back whether it's mm. confirmed, but this would be uh, one of many yes. this year. Uh, right. in what's really a small town. Are you seeing that on the, the rise? And, and we hear a lot about fentanyl too and how that's cut into to many street substances now. Um, you know, the, the amount of death is very upsetting for people working in the field. Um, I think I, you know, many of us have been around long enough to, it. it's not that we're not upset, but it, it makes us more passionate to share information and to educate people around what it means to be addicted. Um, and nobody chose this life. And they're not warped from another planet. They're our people. They're our people. And it's our responsibility to help them look after themselves because they can't do it for themselves. That does not mean we're going to mandate treatment. We've tried that, it's called jail, it hasn't worked, right? We've had a war on drugs. The intention was to get rid of those big drug cartels that turned out for the past 50 or 60 years to be a war on people who use drugs. And we criminalized substance use which is really a health issue. Addiction is a health issue. We understand this with alcohol. We understand some people will stop using and never use again. Some people will quit cold turkey. Some people need something different. Some people will be on a roller coaster their entire life. And we're accommodating and understanding and supportive. Um, but we don't transfer that over when it comes to other substances. Mm -hmm. But addiction is addiction. It's the same addiction. And they're the same human beings. Um, and so one of the biggest pieces of work that we do is to be in relationship with people who've been discarded and disposed of by the rest of our community. Mm -hmm. And so our hope in our work here is, is that we're able to support community to learn what it means to be addicted to a particular substance. What are some of the substances that we're seeing here and what are they doing to our people? And how can we work together to help keep everybody safe to reduce that harm? I'm not sure I even answered your question, but I can <laughs> easily bring, get off on a tangent. Raised more. Um, when you're looking from your perspective, from the work you do, you live this every day. It's an ecosystem of things that need to support each other. What do you think in terms of socially, maybe policy, what needs to change for us to work towards a solution to better support our whole community? Um, even people that I think some people don't have the time for, that they don't yeah. have the patience to understand. I, you know, have done a few presentations lately and, and um, I find it very encouraging when I'm able to chat with people for an hour or two. And at the end of that conversation, they're like, you have changed my mind on how I look at this problem. We need to come at it from a different perspective. We know this approach that we've been using of criminalizing substance use, of locking the doors, of locking people up. It hasn't worked. I had a police officer, I was doing a lunch and learn with some police officers a couple of months ago, and one of them had worked further west in the country in a bigger city and said, you know, harm reduction's had its chance and it hasn't worked. I'm like, whoa, we have had to fight for every little thing. When I talked about getting the crack pipes and then the bull pipes, and we've had to fight for everything and now we're fighting for some more, but I still don't have access. We, 
We don't have access to detox today. We don't have access to rehab treatment, um, supportive housing. Um, we don't have safe supply where people could access a supply from a dispensary or pharmacy of the substance they're addicted to mm -hmm. rather than buying the poison that's on the street. People are like, "What? Are you crazy? You're gonna, you're gonna give people free drugs?" I'm saying their body requires them to have that substance. But even if it's recreational, I'm not talking about opening uh, something similar to cannabis, cannabis MB or mm -hmm. uh, a liquor store or something like that. Um, it really, they would have to register, be in a program, etc. But we wouldn't have all of the illegal entities selling that crap we would no longer have police consuming their time. We would not be paying lawyers and judges and court staff, and we'd take two thirds of the people out of our jail. The money we would save out of jails or correctional centers, the money we would save would not only pay for those substances, there'd be money left over to do other things. And the police officer looked at me and said, are you trying to put me out of work? And I said, I'm sure I could come up with some things for you to do. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's it. So what sounds so crazy, if we think, uh, think of it from a harm reduction perspective, it's a much safer way. And it puts people in contact with people when they decide they're ready to do something different. Everything they could possibly need is right there. And, you know, we did a great experiment during COVID. Isolation centers across this country, in order to keep people who were homeless or from shelters who contracted COVID, were put into an iso isolation center. In order to get them to stay there, they were provided the substance that they were addicted to while they were there, whether it was cigarettes or alcohol or uh, methamphetamine or an opiate, because they would have been unable to stay within that center without those things. Mm -hmm. So we tried it, it worked and people didn't wanna leave. They had a roof over their head and food to eat. They weren't out stealing, dealing, sex working, trying to get the money to buy the next pill mm -hmm. because it was there and they didn't have to worry about it. And then we can start to look at the trauma that people have experienced. It really is a bigger picture than not just so simple of we just need to get that person into treatment. It's, it is not that simple. And when you look at things like methadone clinics, when it comes to right. heroin addiction, um, how do you explain that to people who might be, might stigmatize something like sure. that? So there are, even within health services, there's all kinds of stigma still associated. So we have methadone, suboxone, sublocade, cadian, um, injectable opiate agonist therapy. There are all kinds of different options when it comes to um, treatment. And, um, you know, I've talked to a, a number of people who have died because they had sepsis, an infection that's moved throughout the body because they wouldn't go to hospital. So places that people should be able to go to get help are the last place they will go. So we need to do it differently. We need to provide the option, not the demand. Because did you do what your mom and dad told you to do? No, <laughs> no, right? Saying don't do it doesn't mean people aren't going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, we need to have a different approach. We have had over 4,000 clients go into treatment in the last 15 years and we never asked one of them. What we did was be in relationship with them, treat them with some dignity and respect as a human being first. And then when they were ready to do something different, they came to us and asked for help because they're vulnerable and they are treated like garbage everywhere they go, banned, barred, the bathroom door is locked. How, then you're gonna get charged for doing something in public that should be done in privacy, but we locked the door. And I, this is ongoing in every community right straight across this country. Mm -hmm. um, St. Stephen, St. Andrews, St. George, and we may not see it, today mm -hmm.
But when we start to see it, that's when people start getting worked up. So I really love to have the opportunity to get out and chat with people about why are people doing some of the things they're doing. Somebody addicted to an opiate needs a pill every four hours. You know, when we use, you only need to use crack or crystal meth a couple of times, it rewires the brain, but we don't want to tell our kids about it. We don't want to tell our kids what it looks like so they can say no. We want to protect them by not telling them, makes no sense. No, so there's so many issues involved in, in all of this, not just a simple, easy fix. I can imagine the challenges that you are up against when you're trying to demystify people about mm -hmm. everything that you do, but you see those success stories too yeah. on a daily basis. Does that keep you going? And, and oh, you said sure. there are thousands, so you have the human stories yeah. behind. We do. I've been invited to baby showers and weddings, and I've also um, organized a funeral because somebody somebody's family has nothing to do with them anymore and even in death they want nothing to do with them so th there is so many extremes there's a great deal of sadness and sorrow and there is joy you know so those that invitation to the wedding is fantastic but i try not to be at either end of that spectrum, but journey with the person in your successes and in your failures, because to me, you're the same person today, whether you used today or you didn't, whether you got married or whether you're dying, mm -hmm. you're still a human being. And it's that relationship with people that is most important, most critical. No, nobody's warped in from another planet. And I know anybody who's heard me do a presentation, well, I use that over and over again. There are people, our mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, co-workers, neighbors, our friends. Um, and I, I just keep repeating that because it is the basis of being successful mm -hmm. in helping somebody change their life. I think when people who maybe don't understand addiction, um, what they also don't understand is withdrawal and why that can not only be scary for someone who's addicted but potentially deadly. Can you talk a little bit about that and why sometimes having an approach that doesn't take someone immediately off whatever substance they're addicted to is important? You know, if, if we were all prescribed an opiate, after a couple of weeks we're dependent. We're not addicted, but we're dependent, which means if we stop taking that medication, we're going to have some withdrawal system symptoms. And the longer we're on that medication, the more severe or the higher the dose, the more severe those symptoms will be, which can involve a really bad headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach cramps, leg cramps, cold sweats. People can die. And with cocaine, crystal meth, stimulants can cause sudden cardiac arrest. There's so many different health implications for people who've been using particular substances to come off appropriately. Sudden cardiac arrest from benzodiazepine, benzos, so uh, uh, Valium, Ativan, Clonazepam. Um, there's so many different substances out on the street. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of people who know lots more about that than I do. Um, but what we see are the direct impacts for people um, in trying to stop using substances. So doing it cold turkey is not really the safest or best way. But we don't have access, again, to those treatment beds, to detox at the snap of our fingers. It may be that someone has to wait 10 days to get into detox or three months to see an outpatient counselor. These are not gonna, these kinds of responses are not going to work. Um, and mental health and health services and social services that we have, the system is not set up to support people who are having to worry about where's the roof over my head tonight? Where, how am I getting dry footwear? What am I going to eat? Where am I getting that next pill or that next substance that I need, that my body's telling me I have to have? 
are not going to worry about, oh, I have an appointment with Vicky at two o'clock this afternoon at such and such a building. Like that's just not reality. We need to do it differently. We need to bring those supports and services to community, to people, by people who understand the trauma they've lived through and the addiction they're living with and will for the rest of their life. It's every day for the rest of their life. There is no cure. Um, and they had no part to play in determining whether or not they would be addicted or not. Yeah. I've had people say, well, they made a choice at some point. I'm like, so you were at a party and someone said, oh, here, have a puff of this or that. Nobody explained to you the choice you were making. We don't explain it to our kids and we don't explain it, you know, we definitely as adults, I had one of my kids they'll kill me, but um, when they were younger, sit around the supper table, you never know what we'd be talking about. Say, mom, what's crack look like? I'm like, how are you in grade 11 and you don't know what crack looks like? I said, lucky for you, you have a mother that knows the answer, <laughs> right? But, <laughs> but it really is true. We're asking people in our community and uh, particularly our young people to say no when they don't know what it is and they mm -hmm. don't know what, the choice is that's being made. So yes, you're making a choice to do something, to have fun at a party, but nobody explained to you what that choice is. So it doesn't matter if you're 15 or 50, mm -hmm. the end result is the same. And you make such an important point about our system not being ready to handle people right away when you have that cry for, oh, I think I need help. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can get that treatment tomorrow, which means the easiest treatment is going back to what you know and yeah. what you know is available. We have one minute left and I do want to have you back. So no, this is an open invitation to be here um, anytime you're in Southwest New Brunswick, but for your final minute, can you just give us a few words on uh, your, your, uh, what you want people to take away from this interview and, and maybe um, how we can get on a better track here in this part of the world? I, it would be my hope. And I, I think Avenue B, has been present and is hoping to continue to grow our presence in this whole area. Um, and we do work in the Funday Isles as well, but it, it is our mission from St. Stephen all the way to Sussex, including the Funday Isles, to help people understand what it is that others are going through and to answer questions wherever and whenever we can around substance use, harm reduction, how can we reduce harms for people that in the end reduces harm for you and your family and your community. Um, and that so many people, when they have the information, look through a different lens. I think we can help people see things through a different lens. I'm not sure that the war on drugs is going to stop anytime soon. But we need to provide the support ongoing as we move forward to harm reduction because it reduces the harm for all of us um, because this war has been an utter failure. Well, thank you so much. And again, come back anytime. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. My guest today has been Diane Kearns of Avenue B. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thank you for watching Southwest Magazine. Southwest Magazine is a news and public affairs production of CHCO Television.